one of the things I've always been curious about is all the different things that you use Emacs for, because I've, mm. you know, you've you've been one of our role models for ages now, and clearly you do a lot of Emacsless programming with it. But we you know what's a day in the life of John Weekly, right? Uh, like, let's see. Well, I spend the most of my time in org and GNU's. Yeah. So I, all of my all of my task management. I think I've processed over five thousand different tasks in org mode now. <laughs> <laughs> since I started using it. So I'm a very, very heavy org mode user. Um, I'm always in GNU's, always checking my email through that. I yeah. use ERC. I actually run a second Emacs. So for my Mac, I've built another Emacs under another name, and I use that <laughs> Emacs just for running ERC. And I stay oh. Yeah, and I use that in conjunction with Biddleby so that I'm always on IM, always on IRC, and also that's my Twitter client as well. Wow. So that's always running on the side as well. And I spend a lot of time then in eShell. Um, yeah, of course. All the programming modes. Um, <laughs> I, most of my day work is in C and C++ when I'm not hacking uh, Elis. Uh -huh. So why uh, do you keep your ERC in a separate Emacs? To minimize distraction or just because? Well, when I'm hacking on Emacs, I end up needing to restart it quite oh, often. Yeah. Many, many, many times a day sometimes. Mm -hmm. And that's because... I never know which definitions, uh, you know, sometimes you change a definition from a function to a macro or vice versa, yeah. and then you don't know which other definitions you have to re-evaluate in order for them to inline uh, the new definition. Yeah, and so yeah. rather than have to figure that out all the time, I just restart Emacs. <laughs> Hence your uh, trick of, uh, you know, making sure everything's compiled and also making sure that you're, you're requiring all the files you need so that, that it loads up cleanly. Yes, you know, I just recently fixed a problem in my .emacs, and I discovered that compiling it was not giving me any speed benefit. Oh. I, I thought compilation was what was making my Emacs run so fast, and it wasn't. It was that I was loading, when I was running a non-byte compiled .emacs, I was loading things I didn't need to load. Uh. So when I fixed that problem, which is now fixed in my .emacs repository, Emacs still loads in just, just over a second, but without doing any byte compilation. <laughs> My yes, I, was, I, I must definitely be doing something wrong because my Emacs takes a while to load. <laughs> How long? I, I don't know. I tried using the profiling thing and um, because I'm using the Emacs starter kit, it actually it didn't get very uh -huh. deep. But I, I'm thinking, as you know, it, it feels like 10 seconds or so. It takes a while. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I can't really be bouncing it up and down like you do. So okay, so you do a lot of Emacs, you know, list programming. Naturally, you're you're on ERC, you're on, uh, yeah, and you're doing your C and C plus plus development. Are there other like really weird things that you do that um, people wouldn't expect Emacs to handle? Let me think. Well, I use I use it to play chess online. <laughs> Yeah, there's so many games in it. It's like I play NetHack in Emacs, so you yeah. know, pot kettle black here. <laughs> yeah. Um, I use it to look at uh, databases. Oh, yeah? Uh, yeah, I use it, let's see. I, of course, use Tramp to edit not only files remotely, but also local files through sudo. Oh, yeah. So that I, so that I can edit them. Yeah. Um, let's see, weird things that I do in Emacs. Oh, oh, and a, a, a mode I forgot to mention is that I use Git for all the version control that I do. Oh, absolutely. And so Magit is a mode that I just basically live in. I mean, oh. for any project that I'm working on, the Magit buffer becomes the home buffer for that project. Uh-huh. And I'm constantly looking at that buffer to see what work I've done, what should be committed now. I haven't made that a big part of my workflow yet, but I've heard such good things about it. Yeah, it's a very nice mode. Um, I use it in conjunction with the built-in VC mode of Emacs. Oh, yeah? So if I'm editing a file and I really quickly want to know what have I done to this file, I'll do control X V tilde to get mm -hmm. the, or control X V equals, I mean, to get the diff of the current file. But if I want an overview of what have I been doing, what have I been touching, I'll go to the magic buffer and look mm -hmm. at the stack. I guess you version control your org files, too. Do you, you know? Yes. <laughs> What do you do to manage? Like, how, how many org files do you typically work with, and, and um, how I do you have, manage all that? I think I have eight, but the thing is, all of my active tasks exist in a single org file. Yeah. The other seven yeah. org files are all archives. Ah. So I have an archive file for every project, even though the project, the live project, lives in the main to-do file. Mm -hmm. That way, when I do an org search, it's only at that time that it loads in all of the other org files to do the search. 
I need work to be as quick as it can, since I'm just basically always modifying uh, tasks and adding tasks to it as the day goes on. That could be it. I've got like a you know humongous org file, and org grief file <laughs> takes a while trying to parse it. So yes, uh... it does. It does. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I I use Dropbox to synchronize my org mode files to my iPhone. I'm mm -hmm. because I use org mobile. Oh yeah, and, yeah. Uh, another in interesting tool I have found is that there's an app for the iPhone called Dropbox, which lets you take a voice note and then it puts it in your Dropbox. <laughs> And then I've changed, uh, I have an org mode hook so that whenever I open my org mode buffer, if there is an audio <laughs> file in my Dropbox box, it will just pop up Dear Ed and show it to me, meaning, you know, you should listen to this and add this as a note to your org mode now. That's awesome. That's like if this and that and steroids. Yeah. So, because, you know, all, all during the day, new tasks are coming in. They're yeah. either coming in by ideas, by email, by web pages. Um, I have a... Um, a key binding I use in Emacs, uh, since I don't use Meta M for anything else, Meta M is my make a note uh, mm. key binding. Mm -hmm. So whatever I'm at, if I hit Meta M, it'll make uh, a, t a capture, an org capture, and it'll link it to whatever I was on when I did the capture. So if I was on an email, <laughs> it links it to the email. Well, there's a tool for the Mac called Quick Keys, and Quick Keys lets you rebind things globally on your system. So I've made it so that Meta M works anywhere on the system That's and awesome. tries to be intelligent as it can. So if I'm looking at a, a, a web page in Chrome and I hit Meta M, it'll take me to Emacs, pop up the org capture buffer, and then put a link over to the web page that I was looking at. So is that so, using org protocol or just quick keys? It's not using org protocol. It's just using quick keys. The only thing quick keys is really doing is it's switching over. And mm -hmm. then, um, then I use AppleScript from Emacs, ah. talk to Chrome and get the information. <laughs> I actually use AppleScript quite a lot for many different things, but um, using AppleScript from Emacs is something I do often. That's pretty cool. What are some of the other AppleScripty things that you do with Emacs then? Um, let's see. Well, um, I don't like to keep Dropbox running all the time because it, it takes a lot of background CPU. Mm -hmm. um, at the end of a few days when I look at my process list and I look at total time in the kernel spent by all processes, Dropbox is usually number two behind the kernel itself. Yeah, yeah and it's it a little egregious to me when I'm only using it once in a while. So um, I have Apple Script so that in org mode, when I say go get my mobile tasks, it fires off, it starts up Dropbox, waits a half a minute, and then stops Dropbox. So it's just <laughs> running enough time to do the synchronization. <laughs> and of course, I use that async module I told you about yeah. last week to do that work. Wow, it sounds like you you know you got it quite integrated into into <laughs> the other things that you use in your Mac. That's fantastic. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, the, the Emacs is the center of my entire environment. So it's amazing. It's just you know being able to glue all these bits together and 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 make things work. That's incredible. What are some of the things you wish you could glue together? You know, mm -hmm. what, you know what are the 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 John really to do? You know, to code some point in the future list. <laughs> Well, I would like it if Emacs had an FFI, FFI a foreign function interface, so oh, that yeah? I, could talk, I could talk directly to databases and to other things. Um, I know that there are, there's a fork of XEMacs that can communicate directly with Postgres, and something like that would be nice, because there are some systems that I work with where it would just be faster and more efficient if Emacs could talk to those systems directly instead of me having to communicate with them over a process. Yeah, yeah. System. That would be cool. Yeah, or like embedding a Python interpreter or embedding a Ruby interpreter. So that oh, yeah. I mean, come on. Vim is extensible in a couple of different languages now, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I do prefer Emacs <laughs> Lisp. I have, to, I have to tell you that probably of all of the languages that I've used, definitely Emacs Lisp has been, my, has been the most fun. I won't call it the best language out there because it does have its downsides, and it is a little bit slow. I mean, I can't do it, use it for most general tasks. But it's fun because you see results immediately, the debugger is easy to use, the documentation is great and completely available at the tip of your fingers. So I probably, it may be true that I have written more new code in Emacs Lisp than in any other language by this time. <laughs> I mean, I've done I wouldn't more, be surprised. I've, done more, I've worked on more, much bigger projects in C and C++, but those didn't always involve you know, spitting out reams and reams of new code. Whereas as the day goes by, I'm writing new ELAS, ELISP functions, 
usually left and right to get to get particular jobs done. Well, I'm I'm always running into your name when I'm you know like oh planner oh wait that's not me oh you know remember oh ERC oh E shell. <laughs> yeah, too bad not all of those projects succeeded as well as I'd hoped. No, no, but, but like, even, like for example, going back to you know talking about you know org capture and picking up an annotation from somewhere really quickly. I remember when you're playing around with that, right? And just mm -hmm. finding ways to hook parts of Emacs into all the different parts of Emacs. And it's it's great to see so many people playing around with these ideas. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's and a I nice, see, yeah, it's okay. a great community. It's a good culture around Emacs. Yeah. What? How did we end up with something as cool as this? You know, that <laughs> Emacs is pretty unique among the diff. You know, the the I guess the software packages or the other open source tools I've seen. I mean. You know, you Vim users will be pretty happy, and you know, they, they they share a lot of tips. But and and you know, on the other end of the spectrum, there's Eclipse, right? And there's a ton of development work going on on Eclipse. But Emacs is kind of like it's it's old, it's but it's it's still lots of stuff is going on. Why? Well, you know, my opinion on that would be is that the real success was the Lisp machine. Yeah. Because the Lisp machine was an entire machine that was what Emacs is to editing. So you sit down at your operating system, and it doesn't matter what you're using, your editor, your shell, your document viewer, whatever, they're all written in Lisp. You can modify them as they go. The documentation for anything is available um, as you're looking at it. You know, you can pop the system into the debugger at any point in time. <laughs> um, so Lisp machines may not have succeeded, but Emacs Lisp, I mean, Emacs took that environment and that idea and brought it down to the domain of a single application, the editor. But it gives us all of the cool things about the Lisp machines. The mm -hmm. fact that the debugger is available all the time and you know, the documentation is completely cross-linked with everything. Mm -hmm. So I and think that's yeah. probably what we're experiencing, why it's, why it's so much fun. And the fact that you can get in, you can tweak this, you know, tweak just that little thing, just a little <laughs> bit, and then eventually end up with this massive Emacs configuration because you've been tweaking it to fit you. Yeah, yeah. I have to say that the the original designers and 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 Dr. Stallman, they had a very good idea when they put in a lot of hooks yeah. throughout Emacs. Um, there are there are other extensible systems out there in the world that are not as extensible because they lack sufficient degree of hookage inside, you know, places where you can latch on a piece of code to execute when something happens. Yeah. And Emacs has got those everywhere. So that plus its advising system lets yeah. you basically change the behavior of anything or augment the behavior of anything. Yeah. I have to confess, it's one of the things I kind of like about the way, say, let's say Ruby and Rails will let you open up classes, redefine functions, and then, you know, continue on mm -hmm. with your work. So it's you know, the, the extensibility built into the very language is very, very helpful. Yes, yes. It also can be very intimidating. You, you know, you, 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 <laughs> we've talked about this before, you know, that you're maybe one of the few uh, Emacs users over there. I, you know, I will on occasion run into someone who's curious about Emacs but hasn't really taken the plunge. How do we get more people interested in this stuff? Well, getting them interested is not that hard. It's getting them to, to climb the learning curve that is the, Like the one that goes I mean, all spirally? <laughs> that's right. I mean, my wife's a physician, and she sees what I do with org mode, and she's been tempted to learn Emacs just to use org mode. I but hear a lot of stories like that. The learning curve is so enormous that she just doesn't have the time to learn it. How did we end up doing this? How did, I mean, you, t you talked about, okay, at some point you were very much into VI, and then you said, okay, we're going to learn things the Emacs way. Yeah, And then yeah. you just sat down and you did it. Yeah. Is that something, I don't know, we just expect people to sit down and do at some point? Or are there, have you come across any things that make it easier for people? Not necessarily that make it easier, unfortunately. I think it's a philosophy thing. I mean, I use Emacs. I'm in Emacs and I use Emacs probably 70% of my every working day. Wow. And so it, it, it pays dividends to master yeah. it. Yeah, you know, yeah. every, every efficiency gain I get in Emacs, I get to make use of right away. Absolutely. And it pays off as the days go by. Right. So, I mean, there are people that type for their living who don't know how to touch type. And that, to me, is the exact same scenario. How can you work, make your living as an engineer typing day in, day out, and yet lose the productivity that you would gain by learning to touch type? Yeah, you know, yeah. Learning to touch type, yeah, it will take you a few weeks 
um, you know, either use a piece of software, go to a class, whatever. So there is a there is a hump that you have to get over, and you may not have the time to get over that hump right now. But it is an investment, and that investment right. will pay off. Yeah, it's really you know get to know your tools and get to know them really well because you're using them all the time. Are there you know so in terms of Emacs how? Emacs being very, very big, and Emacs being something that keeps moving very, very quickly. What are some mm. of the things that you want to dig into and learn more about? Um, I would like to learn the C side of Emacs more. I've never known the C side of Emacs. Um, I've just re recently been looking at the bytecode interpreter and trying to, to learn how it does what it does to see if there's some ways to get better performance into Emacs. Wow. Um, so, that, so that for me is the undiscovered country. Well, that's where I want to go next. <laughs> yeah, it does sound like a lot of deep magic. Cause, you know, that's yeah. the very core of it. Yeah, wow. it's, not, it's not as crazy as it seems. I mean, it's pretty well done on the inside. Um, Emacs, without all of its Lisp modes and packages on top of it, if you boil it down to just its essence, the kernel is not really that huge. It's a very, very small, very tidy, simple thing. And there, of course, there are places where it has some rough edges that could be smooth, but it's nothing like what people think of as Emacs. You know, they think of this kitchen sink application that does absolutely everything. Well, that's a lot of the Lisp, you know, core yeah, I mean, yeah. Lisp, um, stuff that goes around the little kernel, whereas the kernel is very kind of tight and small. Huh. And um, I want to know more about that because anything done in the kernel, of course, affects everything else. Well, if you ever get around to doing one of those annotated source code with notes and all that stuff, I would definitely <laughs> read that. I I hear you're you're kind of on the you know on the hook for a e shell documentation or whatever else people would like you to write. <laughs> well, that's true. You know, the re there's a reason why the e shell documentation was never written. Um, this would be a whole different discussion, but I have some I have some misgivings about uh, what kind of world the GPL would create if it was everywhere. Because I do a lot of my programming as a hobbyist, but I have to make money programming as well. And yeah. the way to make money through software is usually to sell it. I mean, mm -hmm. otherwise, you, if you make money only through services, that never takes off. Mm -hmm. You know, if you make a piece of software and you license it, it can take off. And it can start making yeah, money yeah. for you. You don't have Passive. to work to earn every day. Yes. yes. And then you can use that time that to you now have stuff. to because it's paying you, yeah, to make more software. Yeah. If the only income you ever made was based on services, then you know you basically have to be working all day long. And when would you ever get your hobby coding done? So when you only have six to six or eight hours a day to to do any coding at all, because you know there's other things that we have to do, you want to be able to have a have a setup where you can do as much creative coding as possible. Anyway, mm -hmm. so since the GPL's view of the world is that you get paid through the services, you get paid through the documentation. When I released eShell, my thought was, okay, fine, I've written the code, the code is in the GPL, so it's freely distributable, you know, I can't charge anyone for it, but if they want services around eShell, then they can pay me for that. So mm -hmm. I have always told the community that if somebody wants to step up and pay for it, I'll write the eShell documentation. Mm -hmm. But that's never happened. How so if the community doesn't value the eShell documentation yeah. enough to pay me to do it, then why would I spend the time that I could be spending coding to write it? So do you know like what kind of bounty system we have or something like that for a couple of people, you know, for lots of people to say, okay, I want to pitch in so and so much to, uh, to uh, eShell yeah. documentation? Yeah, do or a Kickstarter one? project, for example. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that would be cool. You know, you, you've been an awesomely prolific uh, Emacs list programmer, so it'd be interesting. Well, it's for more me. that just that I've been doing it for so long. It's been 18 years now since the first package 18. I wrote that was <laughs> Emacs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know you were just a kid back then when I was writing a line.el. <laughs> I was 10. Yeah. I've used a line.el. <laughs> yep. Being made when you were 10. <laughs> But it's you know, are you seeing um, are you seeing a lot of other young people also get interested in this kind of stuff? Oh, sure, sure. I mean, it's basically if you're not going to be using an IDE like Visual Studio or Eclipse or something, yeah. Emacs is still one of the two great editors out there. It's either going to be you go with Emacs or you go with Vim. So yeah. it still it still pulls in new people all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because there's there's just so much, and then once people start customizing it, they get sucked in and as, as you said earlier there, there's a lot of interest in Emacs as well from the non-technical side of the world yeah like writing scientific papers sure sure we're getting a lot of new users just because of org mode nothing else I I know it's 
emerged so how many years ago was that that's well, maybe uh, some time ago and and now it's it's just grown to this massive thing where people are writing their research papers and they're, they're doing <laughs> their data analysis in org babel and, and yeah. having stuff come come out it's you know literate programming writ large yeah yeah i started using it in 2007 and i think it was a couple years old by then already yeah yeah and you know i tried to drop org mode a couple times I thought I, I was thinking, you know, there are sexier looking apps for the Mac. There are apps that have better and tighter integration with the iPhone. So on two different occasions I left or converted all of my tasks over to a different program, <laughs> used that program for a few months, came back to org and I was always I always felt happy to be back in org. I don't know what it is about it. It's just it looks right. It feels right. You know, it's it's got the right balance between um how finely you can enter and manipulate the information and how like coarsely you can look at it at a glance. Mm -hmm. um, other applications that I used, I don't know, there was just something about them that I wasn't getting the tasks done. I would put all the tasks into the application and then I'd be excited about it for a few <laughs> weeks and then after a couple months, I just wouldn't look at them anymore. I would know that the tasks were in it, but I would never do anything about them. That's Whereas, yeah. Go ahead. Whereas in org mode, um, the way I use org mode, I use it like a day planner so that every task that I intend to do is scheduled for a particular day. And so I'm, I'm looking, I'm rescheduling tasks and moving them to new days every single day for, for years now. And it just never has felt like a burden. So some, there's something that org does right. Well, there's that the hack that you you told me about the other time where you uh, you change your window size and so you're watching it shrink as you finish your task. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's <laughs> I, fit, little, I fit it to the window. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Little motivational hacks that you can do because you can play around with a with a tool itself. I remember when I was trying to learn flash you know, through flashcards using flashcard EL, I rigged it up so that it would tell me a joke using fortune every time I got something <laughs> right. <laughs> It was either that or show me a cute, you know, cat picture from the files uh -huh. that saved off I can has cheese room. You know, the fact that you can hack it to do all sorts of crazy things. That's sure. incredible. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I just started playing around with its ability to view PDF files. It can uh, be because, what? <laughs> yeah, you can you can use control X, control F and just open a PDF file and you'll see it in your Emacs. It renders them page by page as PNG files and then uses the image viewer. Uh, the image magic extension built into Emacs 24 to show you those pages, <laughs> which is just me because I'm often looking at a at a language specification at the same time as I'm writing code, and it's kind of nice to have it in another buffer the way I would have Emacs documentation. You know, I, I can look at the C++ standard now and have it just be in another buffer. So how did you come across this new capability? Because I didn't know about this. <laughs> I think I ran into it accidentally. I think I was in dear ed mode and I hit return on a PDF instead of hitting bang to open it. And then all of a sudden there it was. And I was like, wow, I didn't know Emacs could do that. So it's basically uh, uh, for, for people who want to learn things, just do random things in Emacs. <laughs> yeah, although if you're going to do random things in Emacs, take notes. Otherwise, you'll never know how to get back to what you found. <laughs> well, that's, that's what the lossage buffer is for, isn't it? Yeah, the lossage <laughs> buffer can be a bit hard to read, though. <laughs> or uh, what's that uh, execute extended command or whatever the thing gets back to you to? Uh, yeah. yeah, so... It, so it, I did find on Emacs Wiki a mode called command log, and it, it keeps oh. in a very readable form every command that you use. I, I, I definitely have to pick up this habit of yours of just reading the entire Emacs Wiki. Yeah. Do That's how I started learning. You know, you ask about how people get over the learning hump. Well, yeah, I'll yeah. tell you what I did. Uh, back in 1994, when I started really wanting to know Emacs, what I did was I printed out the Emacs manual, which at the <laughs> time was, I think, seven or 800 pages. And it was just single-sided paper. You know, I probably killed a small tree doing it. But I brought that stack of papers over to my desk, and I put it on the side. And at the time, my machine was slow enough that I was often waiting for builds to finish. So what I would do is while whatever was building on my machine, I would pick up the top page of the Emacs <laughs> manual, I'd read it, and then I'd throw it away. You know? And I just did that over a several weeks' time. I ended up reading the Emacs manual in all of this dead time I had waiting for compilations to finish. Oh and I gosh. made that a yearly habit for about the first four years just to constantly refresh my knowledge of what's in there because it's such a massively huge environment. But it helped. It helped. 
So my story is that I've used Emacs Speak to uh, synthesize the Emacs manual so I can listen to it while walking around. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> oh, great. And I actually, because I was reading my mail off news at the time, right? So uh, you, you oh. could use Emacs Speak to read your mail and all sure, of that stuff. Sure, sure. You find all these ways to cram information to your brain. I would be up for you know listening to more podcasts. Or I see you know people are coming out with with books as well. So there's you know there's there's the org mode book. Um, that that might be another way for you to do it, right? You take your you write your documentation. You say here's a book that you can buy, but then it's very speculative work, I suppose. Yeah. Well, you know, there's probably a there's. Actually, speaking of other things that integrate into Emacs, thank you for writing Ledger, by the way, because I still run all my finances oh, sure. with it. I can't. Fig- I have no idea where I'm going to find an accountant who understands Ledger. So who knows? If you know, <laughs> Our biggest problem right now. I know. Well, uh, so either either uh, we, we put together a Kickstarter or whatever, so like you end up writing a like a manual, and then accountants all over the world will be, oh my gosh, this is awesome. Uh, or or I just find a way to uh, deal with QuickBooks. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Ledger does yeah, have a manual. That was a, that was one I wrote the yeah, manual yeah, yeah. for. <laughs> yeah. It's also not GPL. <laughs> there you go. So there are ways to for you to to work around that. But yeah. So okay. So your your ideal is figure out how people can pay you for documentation because the, all the all the code is GPL anyway. So like other other models that seem to be working for other people. Support, other I guess. So other other business models, other ways to make the awesome hackers that work on this stuff happy, so that people can keep working on this cool stuff. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Not with Emacs hacking. I mean, I've been paid one time now to do a course on Emacs because my company does training, and Emacs training is one of the things that we do offer. I think but you should that's... consider. You should definitely explore that remote training aspect. That'd be cool. Sure, sure. We're looking into that. But I think I believe that is the only time in my life that I have actually earned money <laughs> for just because of Emacs. <laughs> so no one's so picking has, you up yet and Emacs for itself consulting? Monetarily, but it's paid for itself other ways. Well, in terms of efficiency, you know, being able to do all these things Absolutely. and fly through that, that certainly helps. Okay, so so that might be an interesting challenge for us also. Figure out how you can get more Emacs geeks, you know, to be <laughs> rich and famous. Yeah, <laughs> that'll be the day. Imagine if we had an Emacs app, app marketplace. <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> wow, just just propose that idea on the mailing yeah, list. Yeah, that would be so popular. <laughs> but it is very nice to you know just be able to play around with all these different packages, and there's thousands that you can you can do, and yeah. and the fact that a lot of, you know. A lot of them will go and, and look for ways to integrate with each other, like the way that sure. BB, BBDB integrates with Moose, right? Yeah, yeah, that's another one that I use. Yeah. Um, and there's always new stuff coming out, and authors are very good about interacting with each other. Um, that The author of Helm just recently incorporated uh, using my async module yeah. that I wrote. Yeah. Um, and he, so he did that just in a matter of a few days, and since Helm is something I rely upon all the time, I'm very happy to see that. Yeah. That was actually one of the challenges I came across when it came to uh, writing documentation, writing a book about Emacs, especially the, the, the modules that people are working on, the packages, right? Because you'd, mm-hmm. you'd share an idea, and then the maintainers would be like, oh, that's an ex- excellent idea, and then they would fold it in. <laughs> so you kept running out of book topics. Yeah, I uh... <laughs> <laughs> But that's, you know, that's a good thing about the community. It, it moves so fast. Sure. Um, yeah, if people are looking to know Emacs better, they should also stop by the IRC channel because I'm there every day and a lot of people there can give good help if you have yeah. questions. It only looks off topic from time to time, but if people show up with Emacs yeah. questions, it also they depends on the answers. time of day, too. <laughs> <laughs> so, so evenings tend to work out for you or when do, pe- when, you know, when do people usually hang out there? Well, I'm a night coder, so that's when I'm there. Um, yeah. But people are there all, all around the clock. Yeah, I tend to drop by in the evenings too um, when I remember to do that. But you know, ERC makes it so easy because it's just there. So sure. Yeah, I haven't I seen you there that often. Background. You should come by. I know. More. I know. Um, I always see you like in the very end of my night. So the, what would be dawn for most people? That's when you usually come in. That's funny. 
I gotta okay, so I, I gotta work out the timing. Actually, one of the things I want to do is figure out if we can have some kind of a regular Google Hangout or whatever, right? Because it's easy to to do screen sharing through that, and you can have multiple people. Mm -hmm. So if we just get people together and say, okay, what have you learned about Emacs lately? Then it's slightly more visual than IRC. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and so anyway. there's also there's also Twitter. A lot of people use that to talk about new stuff they've found in Emacs. Yeah, I see a couple of people tweeting um, like kind of really, really short Emacs tips, and it's great to see that kind of stuff going on. Mm -hmm. I remember people used to have uh, Emacs tips in their email signatures as well. So, <laughs> so all, the, you know, all these little ways to kind of increase randomness, I guess because Emacs is so huge yeah. that if you just find little ways to say, oh, hey, there's this new feature or there's this interesting command over here, who knows it'll spark. Yeah. Yeah. There's oh. just too much, too much stuff, too much good stuff. So you'd recommend that if people are new, that they should check out the IRC channel, um, Emacs yeah. TV, of course. Here's Go the through the Emacs tutorial first. Oh, yes, of course. Then, then stop by the channel, read the Emacs manual, you know, pick something you want to accomplish with Emacs and sort of focus your learning around making that happen rather yeah. than taking on the task of trying to swallow the whole thing right up, from, right up front. Yeah, and it seems like people easily divide into, okay, you want to do programming, check out the Emacs wiki pages in the respective languages, yeah, yeah. get a enough place to start. And then if you want to do text editing, oops, or, you know, subspecies uh, research paper editing or whatever else, then there are pages for that too. Yeah. yeah, and there's always more stuff out there than you're aware of, because I've been trying to make myself aware of everything that's out there, and I keep running into new stuff on a daily basis. Just yesterday, I found Swank GS, JS, which lets you interact with the uh, JavaScript interpreter inside of your browser as a REPL. Hey. Yeah, so you can, you can connect to Firefox and then be manipulating the web page through an Emacs REPL using JavaScript. Isn't that crazy? That is pretty crazy. But I can that... see if I, was, if I were doing web development, I can see that that would just be invaluable. Yeah, yeah. That sounds cool. I will go have to check that out. <laughs> uh, and then you also mentioned a couple of other Emacs blogs, like Mastering Emacs. And yeah. actually, is that one syndicated on the Planet Emacs end yet? I don't know. I don't. I'm not sure if I have. See, I, I aggregate all of my feeds and GNU's into a virtual group, so I'm yeah, never yeah. aware of actual source of any feed. I just get presented with one group that has all of the current happenings in Emacs. Mm. Someday we should totally get your OPML and, you know, kind of cross-reference uh -huh. it against everything that's syndicated there. That's true. You know, actually, that wouldn't be a bad project, is to, keep, is to maintain an OPML file of all of the Emacs feeds out there in, the, in the, the net. Because I would love to keep my list updated. You know, I went through and did a web... I did a search through through Gween to see all of the feeds it had syndicated, which of yeah. course is not all the feeds that are out there. Oh yeah. And I did that. I did that two years ago, so there have been new feeds since. Mhm. Mm okay. So uh, so de definitely, uh, I'll take that as a way to as a to do and uh, see if uh, Planet Emacs and you know will have all these things or maybe uh, uh who's who's that in charge of it? Was it um. Edward, I think. Edward O'Connor. Yeah, that's right. Uh, that's right. So anytime you find a new feed also, add it to Gween. And then that yeah. way anybody who goes to the Gween server with GNU's can just like do a search for all groups matching Emacs. Yeah, and then yeah. subscribe to them all. So uh, with Gween, when you reply, does it get posted as a comment too? I, I have never replied to anything in a Gween server. Yeah. So I, I have it, no idea what it does. Yeah, it would be tricky to make it that smart. It would be cool, yeah. but it would be tricky. Sure, because there's so many blogging platforms, and some require authorization, and some have captchas, and yeah, it, would, yeah. it would be a little bit tough. Yeah, well, I, I really thank Lars for setting that server up because it allows me to digest a lot of news about Emacs in a very short period of time each day. What else are you? You know, what are some of your other massive amounts of information? Uh, how do I deal with this sort of tips? Hmm. You mean like just coping with data overload? Yeah, uh, whether oh, it's um, in terms of programming or uh, news, as you mentioned, Green is your way of handling RSS, mail. How do you filter? Well, I use virtual groups a lot just to aggregate so that I'm not overwhelmed by a, a huge number of groups that have lots of unread messages. I'd rather mm -hmm. have fewer groups with more messages in them. 
-hmm. And then I use GNU's uh, very handy adaptive scoring. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And actually, in my .emacs repository, there's a file called my GNU score. Yes. And I've codified everything related to my scoring configuration in that file. <laughs> so if you want to use the system that I use, that's the file to get. But adaptive scoring basically allows me to go into a group, and then if I see a thread there that's not interesting to me and I don't read it, I will never see that thread again. So mm -hmm. all of my groups only ever show me either threads I'm currently reading or new threads. I don't have to wade through um, stuff I'm not interested in anymore. I mean, it's, it's not that it just downscores it. It doesn't appear at all. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a good way for me to cope with... Um, the, the thousands of articles per day that get downloaded to my machine because I'm only reading maybe, you know, 40, 40 of them at best. Um, so that's one good way to cope with the data overload. I'm trying to yeah. think. I've never found anything that had the kind of scoring that News has. It's like, I want it in everything. You know, I want it with, with Gmail. I want it with all that stuff. But, eh. <laughs> yeah. Come on, get with the times. <laughs> Yeah. Well, even though I receive my email at Gmail, I suck it down to my machine with with fetch mail, and I put it into a local Dovecot server so that GNU's yeah, yeah. will sway over it. Yeah. Um, the other thing, the other good thing that's valuable with, in coping with data overload is just structure. Structure is really the key to everything. And when structure gets too big, then you just need meta structure. As long as you have some way to get to the thing that you need to know when you need to know it. And you, but your top level view, the thing that you're, cons you're thinking about in your mind is always small, then it doesn't matter how much information that you have. Um, I have a directory, I, I, stop, I stopped deleting things that I downloaded a few years ago. I started having enough disk space that I just keep everything. Because you never know when you're going to want it again, and you never know when that version that you had isn't going to be on the internet anymore, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. So I have, I have a giant file server that I built that just accumulates lots of information. So there's a directory in my home directory called archives. And archives now has about 450 gigabytes of files in it across millions of files. And there's files within files, and it's just, it's just an enormous amount of information. But the way that I manage that, that data overload is just by structure. So I, def I, des I um, developed a taxonomy to, uh, uh, to put things in, um, to, into places by category and by topic so that whenever I have a file or whenever I'm looking for a file, I can know within seconds what the path name leading to that file or group of files is going to be. Because I, because I adhere to the, the taxonomy rigidly. And I have an inbox where new stuff comes in, and then I sort the stuff out from the inbox using Dired into the, you know, <laughs> the taxonomy. Of course, it's Emacs. Of course. But the key there is, is that even though I have all this data, which is way more data than Spotlight or systems like that are ever going to help me search through, by having the right structure, the data is easy to find. So mm -hmm. while I'll use org mode as a sort of meta structure, so that if there are parts of that structure that I'm often referring to, I'll put a link to them in org mode. And so in org mode, I'll have, you know, a hot list. And the hot list are the things I care most about right now. And the hot list will just branch to other lists or to other areas on the machine or to other parts of the web. But you want to keep the hot list down to a reasonably small amount, so like 10 to 20 items. But that should branch out into everything else. Like everything should ultimately go down to the leaves of everything that you have. If you have anything unowned by your hierarchy, it will get lost or it will just become forgotten. Um, so I believe that hierarchy is, is the solution to any problem um, in terms of data overload. That's excellent. I, I was just thinking about how I can start organizing my, my ever-growing org files. And um, I've been trying to create you know, categorical indexes and just going through all these things and creating links to my blog because that's you know, external information and all <laughs> that. But it's, it's, it's fascinating to see how people are organizing, especially since you've been using it for a while and you have tons of information in it. Yeah, so, yeah. And lists of lists. A lot of that information I keep needing to refer to even years later because I'll remember, like, you know, I knew, I knew at one point how to disable the Spotlight Indexer, for example, but I can't remember the command. And that command is no longer in my ZSH history file. And, and how am I going to know that information? If I search the web for it, okay, I might find it, disable Spotlight Indexer. But there are some things you just can't search Google for because it's too abstract. 
So I'll I'll write it down in my org mode file, and even though it's in the archive, it's still searchable. It's still indexable. And so I can just ask my whole system, what do you know about Spotlight? And then I'll get a list back of all the things I ever thought were valuable to know about Spotlight. And in that list will be, you know, indexing, disabling it, etc. That is pretty cool. That 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 that'll be a that is an excellent use of org mode, I think. I remember yeah. you you showed me a glimpse of your Emacs org file where you're listing all these things that you were learning about Emacs and that file looked really long. Yes, yes. <laughs> It does require some uh, some some investment though, because maintaining structure like this requires always weeding and pruning, you know, sort of combing and and going through the data. Um, my wife and I have a word for it. She's Persian, and the Persian word for putting things in order is monazam. So she'll ask me. I'll be at my computer playing around with it, and she'll say, "Are you monazaming?" Which means, you know, I'm basically <laughs> all that I'm doing. Is I'm just moving stuff around and I'm renaming things and I'm I'm building index links and you know that might not be a fun task for everyone. I mean, maybe a part of me was, was always wanted to be a librarian when I grew up, but I actually get a lot of pleasure out of that. I find it relaxing. I find that imposing order on the chaos of my machine gives me a greater feeling of order in my own life, and then that makes me better able to handle the new information that's going to come in, you know, the next day. Plus, you remember what's in your what's in your file, so you know what you can search for. Yeah, that's a big. That, yeah, it's very important because our memory is, you know, it's not going to ever be good enough to just keep keep our eyes on the thousand things we have in our configuration or the million things we might have on our machines these days. You know, and that doesn't that doesn't even include all the things we've seen on the internet, thought were cool, but haven't noted down anywhere. You know, we just remember that it's there, but, you know, we're losing those all the time, and we're not yeah. aware that we're losing them. <laughs> yeah, well, at least until you uh, plug your uh, your browser history into an org thingy that automatically captures all of that stuff. I don't know. People used to have browser true. plugins that did that. But That's then, a yeah, neat yeah. idea, actually. Hmm. <laughs> oh, no! <laughs> Oh, I, I like that idea of a well. The reason I used to not have any cap on my history in in yeah. the browser, but ultimately it makes the browser too slow. Yeah. But it would be nice to sort of queue it out to a log file. Yeah. You know, or a database where it just gives the the link, the title, and a synopsis of the contents. That would be kind of nice. <laughs> okay, a, so we'll okay. see it next week then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, so we've got lots of you know lots of tips on on all these different things you can do with Emacs or to get started, uh, how to organize a huge you know huge huge archive of information, basically lists of lists and breaking things down. Um, any other parting words before I go uh, line up other people to to bring on to this like let's talk about Emacs thing? <laughs> <laughs> Just that Emacs is fun. All of this technical stuff, all these features. The reason I use it is because it's fun. It is. It's a lot of fun, and it's it's even more fun because you get to bump into. Well, I get to bump into people like you, and and the <laughs> Emacs community is so awesome. So, yeah, uh, and I got to know you through it as well. That's a great thing. Yeah, you know that when you made me the maintainer of Planner, I was like, oh my gosh, I've never maintained anything before. So that was a, <laughs> I was a university student. It was an excellent experience. So, yeah. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, well, yeah. I've always appreciated the little cards that you've sent me from time to time through the years. <laughs> <laughs> Mentioning your uses of planner, <laughs> the things I should that send you are. I actually should send Karsten some too, because I've been, you know, as uh, Sebastian, I think it's a new maintainer, isn't he? So, um, yeah. yes, Emacs appreciation cards. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. I think that's a great thing to do. Yeah. Thanks, well, Sata. Community. Thank you so much. Nice talking to you. And I'll catch you again <laughs> sometime. Okay. Have a good night. All right. Bye bye. <laughs>